thank you very much for the introduction, and thank you very much, everyone, uh, for coming here today. It's a pleasure to be back at ODI on this sunny Friday. Um, what I'm going to do today uh, is briefly outline uh, some of the things Paul was just talking about, the background to this research and where it comes from uh, in ALNAP and in ADRN. Uh, I'll then describe a bit about what we did, uh, the research process and methodology. Um, I'll talk a little bit about some of the, the theory that goes into the thinking behind the report, uh, particularly around the forms and functions of networks, um, how they're shaped and, and what they do, uh, before talking a bit about what we found in terms of uh, uh, the data that was coming out of the cases that we looked at and the uh, success factors that we identified about what makes uh, networks uh, work successfully uh, at the national level. Um, I think, as Paul mentioned, it's important to recognize that networks are really ubiquitous uh, in the 21st century, not just in the humanitarian system, but as a form of organization generally. Um, and that's an interesting trend, but it's also unhelpful from a research perspective because it means the term risks becoming devoid of any uh, meaning as an analytical or descriptive tool. So many things are described as networks these days that it's very difficult to identify what we mean. And I'll come back to that when talking a little bit about the, how we defined uh, what a network was as a unit of analysis in this research. Um, but uh, networks are prevalent throughout society and they're particularly prevalent in the humanitarian and development sectors. And I think that, as Paul mentioned, is a, is a factor of the nature of the system that you have autonomous actors who are also at the same time interdependent on one another. Uh, and so collaboration is a necessity, uh, and uh, because of that, a range of different collaborative forms <coughs> have, have emerged uh, in recent years. Um, and there's been increasing attention upon them, particularly at the international level, people looking at uh, what the success factors are. I was thinking there's some copies here of ECB's report on what makes collaborations work, and there's been uh, other pieces of work by Rapid ODI and others. Um, but there's been much less looking at the national level and particularly looking at uh, how national NGOs who are often marginalised from the system engage with those structures or form structures themselves. Um, so that was uh, really the starting point, what's happening at a national level around uh, humanitarian networks. Um, as Paul said, this comes out of a collaboration, an ongoing collaboration, not just around this research, between ALNAP and ADRN, which has been one of the uh, most interesting and inspiring relationships that ALNAP's had uh, uh, while I was working with the network. Um, ALNAP, as many of you know, is a network of international humanitarian actors, uh, NGOs, the Red Cross movement, the UN, donors, and increasingly um, what would previously have been considered non-system actors like uh, governments in affected states. ADRN, who you may be less familiar with, is the Asian Disaster Reduction and Response Network, which is a network of about 35 organizations uh, which are all headquartered in Asia. So most of them are national NGOs working in one country. There are a few organizations like Mercy Malaysia and Seeds India which have international programs. But um, to, be, to qualify to be a full member of ADRN, uh, you must be headquartered in uh, Asia, which uh, is the reason why this research was focused on the region. Uh, and the two networks together have been interested in exploring the role of networks for a number of years by nature of their uh, being networks themselves. Uh, and so we've been having on ongoing discussions about that. And I think we're also interested in, in local actors uh, in general. Um, the, the Tsunami Evaluation Coalition, which was hosted by ALNAP, um, famously called for a fundamental reorientation of the system to focus on local and national actors. But uh, as many of us know, that's been very uh, slow in, in coming forth. And, but however, there is uh, renewed interest from uh, partnership-based organizations, uh, the UN system, in finding new ways to engage with these actors as the, as the first responders in many, in many disasters and emergencies. There was also an interest in how those actors interplay with the international system, um, a feeling that the structures that do exist, um, such as the clusters, uh, marginalize them, as has been identified in the evaluations of the clusters uh, and in uh, ALNAP's own State of the Humanitarian System report. Uh, and so seeing how uh, those structures that do exist interact with local actors and what local actors are doing themselves uh, in light of their marginalization. And I think um, from ADRN in particular, there was an interest in looking at the links between the different levels of the system. For them as a regional organization with members working through national networks uh, underneath them, so to speak, uh, and an international system above them, they were interested in finding better ways to understand and link between those different levels. Um, so as I said, our uh, research focused on national networks and we conducted case study research in the Philippines, Bangladesh and Afghanistan 
I conducted the first two case studies while the consultant Chris Snow conducted the research in Afghanistan. Altogether, we looked at 14 different network entities across the three countries. Uh, and the research was primarily conducted through ADRN, so it was facilitated by members who, uh, of the regional body who were then working at the national level as well. Um, I think it's important to clarify here, we, we didn't set out a, a, a definite uh, be all and end all definition of networks, but we did look at the literature particularly to try and identify some of the, the, the common features and themes that were used to describe networks um, around having ongoing dynamic relationships, around having sort of uh, multi-dimensional exchange, so not just a single flow of resources or, and information, uh, but more uh, multi-dimensional relationships. And about being sort of uh, voluntary connections between essentially autonomous organizations. I think it's also important to note that we were looking only at humanitarian disaster response networks, although there was a lot of, um, lot of uh, blurring of the lines between organizations working on development issues and those working on humanitarian disaster response. For, for organizations working in these contexts, um, there's very little choice about whether you respond to a disaster or not. Um, however, we were looking at networks that did have some uh, explicit uh, interest in working in these areas, even if they focused on other areas as well. Uh, and also, we were only looking at explicit inter-organizational networks rather than uh, informal networks or professional networks of individuals. And so um, that excluded a whole bunch of networks. Uh, and for other reasons, we weren't looking at things like um, uh, the Red Cross networks and the voluntary networks. And although we included networks of faith-based organizations, we didn't look explicitly at church groups and other uh, religious organizations like that. Um, we were focused on drawing on the real experiences of uh, the networks that we were working on uh, and drawing on existing theoretical models. We didn't identify much existing research looking at national humanitarian networks and so thought that taking that kind of exploratory and descriptive approach would be more forthcoming than one based on developing propositions from the theory that did exist, uh, which is why we took the, the case-based approach. Um, and so we were focused on comparison between the case study countries. Um, when we began the research, I conducted a round, a round of uh, interviews with a number of the uh, ADRM members who were working at the national level. And very early on, the Philippines uh, appeared as being somewhere where networks were seen as being particularly active. And that wasn't just something that was true of the, the humanitarian scene. It was something around governance more generally in the country. And so um, we, we very quickly decided that that would be a sort of lead case study that would inform the rest of the work and we'd, we'd use that to inform the methodology as we went forward uh, using that case study approach to ask the sort of how and why questions that we were looking at. Um, we did, however, build on existing work on research and policy networks, much of that conducted uh, in ODI by the RAPID group uh, and used by ALAP in the past, and also looking at uh, work on inter-organizational networks from the public and private sector. Um, what I'm going to do now is briefly describe some of the, the key bits of that, which I think were useful in informing this research, but also hopefully have broader relevance to understanding networks and collaboration. The first is about understanding network forms and the different kind of structures they take. Um, we think it's useful in uh, characterizing the exchange uh, that takes place in a network around the level of centrality. So the first model is sort of the, the centralized network, the classic hub and spoke, where you have some sort of administrative body at the center uh, facilitating uh, relationships uh, with uh, members at the periphery and the exchange between them. Uh, beyond that, you have a kind of decentralized model, which can be understood quite simply as a sort of series of hubs and spokes. Some of the networks we looked at in Afghanistan, for instance, would have a, a headquarters in Kabul and a, and a bunch of relationships coming out of that, but then would have regional centers as well with their own relationships as a sort of series of hub and spokes. But quite differently, you have the, the distributed network where the ties don't necessarily run through a central administrative body, but are much more freeform between the different members and the exchange is, is much more loose. Uh, and I think it's important to understand that these different kinds of form have really important implications for the kind of work networks do and the kind of things that they're good at. And so uh, the functions that they perform, which I'll talk about in a minute, very much follow on from the forms they take. Um, we looked at some research uh, by uh, Provan and Kennis, who were looking at administrative bodies uh, in private sector interorganizational networks. And I found this really useful when trying to understand uh, the distinction between the network as a thing and the administrative body which uh, uh, manages the exchange in the network because I don't think the two things are the same and it's very interesting to, uh, very easy to confuse the two and they draw a distinction between participant governed networks where there's no formal organizing body 
uh, and uh, lead organization networks where a particular organization will take the lead in management exchange and then also uh, network administrative organizations. So those networks that probably most of us will be most familiar with which have some sort of secretariat coordinating body uh, which manages the exchange. And again, uh, what, what type of uh, administrative body or, or uh, structure governing exchange will have implications for the kind of things networks do uh, when we talk uh, about their functions. Uh, a distinction that's been drawn by Mendizabel and others in, in, in RAPID particularly is between support versus agency, which I think is a really interesting one. Is a network uh, supporting its members to do things or is it doing things on their behalf? Um, because those two things are very different and have implications in terms of resourcing, implications in terms of governance uh, and implications as well in terms of sustainability. Um, Another bunch of uh, concepts that we used and adapted for this research was around network functions uh, and the different things that networks do. And I think it's, it's very easy to get uh, caught up in the, in the rhetoric around networks and actually the functions approach is really, really useful for just uh, nailing down on what exactly it is that a network's doing. Um, so we adapted this approach for, for our needs here based on the initial conversations we had and, and made some changes to the model. But basically we came up with these six functions. The first, are, and perhaps the, the, the primary function for networks, is around building a sense of community, and that's about building trust and social capital between the members of a network, um, particularly where there are shared interests and values. Contrasting with that is a convening function, which is about building trust again and about building social capital, but is much more about uh, building bridges between di diverse actors where there's heterogeneity and people may have different... Uh, different agendas, different interests, and different values, and trying to bridge those through the network. And it's a much more difficult function to fulfill than the community building function, uh, but somehow related. There's also, and this is something that many people will recognize about networks, a, a key function for knowledge management uh, and the exchange of information. And looking at the case studies, uh, we found that there were really sort of three types of knowledge management taking place. There was the exchange of knowledge within the network, so exchanging information, practice, and learning between members. Uh, and that was happening in a lot of cases, whether or not it was a, it was a formal, explicit function the network was seeking to perform. Mm -hmm. But there are also two other functions. One was bringing in knowledge, so the role that a network can play in identifying relevant practice and information outside of the network uh, and bridging the exchange to members within. within. And also where networks are developing practice on their own and, and developing uh, policies and procedures that are relevant outside, the extractive function of, of, of gathering uh, learning from within a network and, and promoting it outside the network. And that relates to the next function, which is around amplification and advocacy. And I think this is a key area where people see networks as being more than the sum of their parts and adding value over and above the individual members. And that's drawing on the experiences of, of of individual network members and facilitating those and amplifying them at a national level. So a lot of people were talking about the role that they played in grounding, uh, uh, grounding uh, policy and local experiences and, and, and field level experiences, but providing a function that they could then be uh, used to advocate for change at a national level. And uh, people saw that as valuable both within the networks and also as uh, talking to those people that the networks were seeking to influence, uh, saw that as contributing to their credibility uh, and contributing to their success in bringing about change. The next is one that perhaps understandably the network members themselves were particularly interested in, and that was the function that networks can play in mobilizing resources. So that means financial resources, but it also means technical resources and uh, capacity. So that, yeah, that might mean uh, funding for response, but it might mean uh, providing access to trainings, uh, providing access to uh, information on standards, uh, providing technical capacities in response. Um, and it's, it's not... Uh, it's not just about those financial resources, but I think for, for many of the members of the networks we spoke to, that's, uh, that was one of their key motivating factors for engaging uh, with networks. Uh, finally, there was an implementation function, and this didn't actually feature in previous uh, models of functions that existed, but um, in the initial conversations that we had, it was very interesting uh, to talk to people about the role they saw in networks during response and uh, going beyond a resource mobilization function to actually implementing programs or coordinating action during response. And this is something that I found and continue to find slightly problematic because uh, it's not something that someone, uh, that traditionally networks are seen as doing, but I think it's perhaps a reflection of the fact that these networks uh, are operating in the midst of crisis very often uh, and in contexts where there's cyclical disasters. Uh, and sometimes uh, 
by the nature of necessity, they, they move into response modalities. But this itself is problematic because the nature of exchange in networks is about ongoing dynamic ties rather than the kind of decisive decision-based models that you need for, for effective response. Uh, so I'll come back to that a little bit later on. Um, we then apply those models that I've just talked about to, to the networks that we find us uh, in the three countries. And I said uh, we came across uh, 14. Uh, two overall findings is one that there was uh, enthusiasm for national inter from international and international actors for the role that networks can play. I mean, uh, we were very consciously using a purposeful sampling method, so it's a sort of feature of the bias that we knew we were going to find people who were keen on networks, but it was surprising the extent to which people both working in the networks and alongside them saw them as being beneficial. Um, we weren't making independent appraisals of the performance of the individual networks, um, but there was... Um, there was, they were seen as providing value. And uh, in the Philippines, for example, that went way beyond the humanitarian sector so to the whole no notion of network governance being a way of interacting uh, between uh, civil society and the state. In other contexts, that was much more problematic. But people still saw formalized networks as a way of uh, increasing their ability to act uh, and increasing uh, the resources of individual organizations. Um, and there were a really wide range of collaborative structures uh, but many of them are excluding national actors. So um, Bangladesh, for example, isn't a country which has uh, formally uh, the HCT in a cluster system, but even there, so it doesn't have an OCHA office, but even there, there are what I would describe as sort of quasi-clusters. They have something called a humanitarian coordination task team, uh, which operates uh, during disaster response uh, without a formal OCHA presence, but still has the same features of other countries where you have a more formalized uh, humanitarian architecture that national actors feel that they're not able to contribute to that and not able to benefit from it. Uh, and also many international organizations were involved in uh, their own collaborations, international NGO networks, donor consortiums, and so on. Um, but the feeling was that many of these international-led structures uh, were excluding national actors uh, who had formed many of their own uh, structures, uh, which were the ones that we looked at uh, particularly. So the findings on those, on those 14 structures that we looked at, uh, I will divide again along form and function. I think it's really, really difficult to make generalizations about the, the form of the networks. They range from networks like the Afghan Women's Network or um, disaster, reduction, disaster Reduction Results Network in the Philippines uh, with many hundreds of members working on national level policy change to networks with five members or a dozen members working on uh, knowledge management and learning. And so there's a really diverse range of networks and um, doing different things with different kinds of structures. Um, it was interesting to note that most have a nominal equality in their membership. And I think this is really interesting where if you look at the networks that are made up solely of national organizations, in a context like Bangladesh, where you have BRAC on the one hand, one of the largest NGOs in the world, working alongside um, tiny regional coastal-based organizations with only uh, a few staff, there's, there's obviously no equality there. And that's magnified again when you look at those networks which have both international uh, and national members. Uh, but nonetheless, across most of the networks that we looked at, uh, it was a nominal sort of one member, one vote, or however that transpired in the particular structure of the network that was used to make decisions uh, and to take the network forward. Uh, and also, and this is quite a subjective finding, I, I found that there was quite a high degree of formality in the network. So that meant, again, different things in different places. In Afghanistan and, and Bangladesh, that meant that most of the network administrative bodies had their own legal entity and personality. In the Philippines, they tended not to. They tended to be hosted, but again, would have very advanced uh, letters of association in terms of reference and governance structures, uh, and represent a, a, which represents a high degree of formality in the kind of exchanges that take place. Um, so those are some of the general findings we found on form. Uh, turning to function, um, I think there were examples of different networks trying to, to work across, across the functions uh, with varying degrees of success. Um, but it was a challenge to separate the aspirations of the, the networks and their members from the reality of what they were doing. They all talked about exchanging knowledge. They all talked about mobilizing resources. But uh, most of them had very poor structures for monitoring and evaluating their work. Uh, and, and it was difficult to separate what they would like to be doing from what they were really doing. Um, but we did identify four important factors where there was real evidence of success and real evidence of, of, of networks providing value for their members and for the wider system. Uh, 
The first is around building that sense of community. I think it was striking in the, in the Philippines particularly, but also uh, in Bangladesh to see the extent to which people saw these networks as offering a way for individual organizations to build trust among members, but also to build their credibility uh, externally uh, and to build that sense that they were national organizations working together, uh, even uh, where they had serious resource constraints. Um, there was also a lot of work on, on, on knowledge exchange. There were particular networks, uh, for instance, the B Building Disaster Resilient Community Learning Circle in the Philippines, which was explicitly a around learning and knowledge management and, and had focused on that. Other networks with a sort of hub and spoke structure where there was a center uh, providing knowledge services to members, but also other networks that didn't have an explicit knowledge function still providing an opportunity to share experiences, to share learning, and that was something that uh, again and again came up as being a success for these networks. Uh, advocacy was another thing uh, that came up uh, repeatedly, both from explicit uh, advocacy-based networks, but also uh, from those that might be working on other issues. Uh, and finally, and I think this could be as much a challenge as a success, <laughs> uh, channeling resources. People saw it as something they wanted them to do, and they saw the transaction costs of working through networks as, as, as worth as worth it because of the access to, 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 new, to new resources that it could bring. Um, so uh, the key challenges, uh, which I'll talk a little bit more when we talk about the success factors, is one around sustainability. None of the networks, apart from one, which is a private sector network, were sustained by their members. Uh, and a need for links. None of, the, none of the networks were existing wholly in isolation from the international system, but that itself was pro proving problematic, where they needed the access to resources that uh, linking to international organizations would bring, but uh, if there was too much friendliness, it could overwhelm the, the national ownership of the networks. Um, and as I mentioned before, there were instances of these networks moving into program implementation, but that had created in some instances competition and, and had stretched the ability of the networks to manage, uh, to manage the relationships within them. I'll briefly run through the eight success factors that we noted, and perhaps we can then explore those a little bit more in the discussion. Um, I don't think any of them are particularly earth-shattering, and, and many of them are, uh, are uh, common sense, but that can be an uncommon commodity, I think. The first is around having clear aims. I think it's important to recognize that different actors have self-interest and have different uh, intentions when entering into networks, uh, and that itself isn't a problem, but it becomes a problem where the network's aims and functions, uh, aims and purposes aren't clear. And where they are clear, it allows people with divergent interests to work together, and that's really, really important, whether it's a particular policy change or a thematic area where they're working. It's also important to have um, clear structures, and I think that goes back to what I was saying about form earlier, and the notion that the form a network takes really informs the functions that it's able to fulfill. And so thinking clearly about uh, the form and structure of a network will be important when thinking about the kind of things you want it to do. It's also, again, important to have transparent governance. I think. Again, that's an obvious point, but looking a little bit under the surface, balancing informal structures uh, with formal structures around governance is really important, and recognizing that networks need to be dynamic and governance systems need to allow them to be dam dynamic by keeping a turnover of people working in their governance structures uh, and by bringing in fresh knowledge and ideas uh, into the management structures. They also need to have the right size management with uh, uh, membership. We were talking about this a little bit earlier. Uh, you know, big networks necessarily have looser ties between their members, and so if you're trying to bring about uh, really uh, intensive exchange of knowledge, you, you're going to do better in a network with a smaller number of m members. Conversely, if you're trying to advocate for change at the national level, being able to bring together a larger group of actors is going to be important. So thinking about uh, membership and also the, 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 the pressures of transition between small and large memberships is really important. Sustainable funding, we will, as we'd already mentioned, uh, is really important, and uh, some of the successful networks had really different models for doing this. Some were partnering with large INGOs like Oxfam and Christian Aid, who were channeling resources through them. Others, like Niripad in Bangladesh, were working through a kind of consultancy model, providing services through the Secretariat, which they then used to subsidize network activities, and finding ways to do that uh, is really important, and is, is predicated on having strong external links which maintain uh, national ownership of the networks. And finally, leadership's important, but it's not about the kind of individual charismatic leadership that's often associated with humanitarian operations, although Paul would uh, uh, have a lot to say about that. But having uh, dynamic leadership, which is based on humility and an understanding uh, of the collaborative nature of networks, is really important. Uh, and the final point I'd make is that, almost paradoxically, when you're looking at these networks that are operating uh, 
primarily a lot of them in a development continuum that are working a lot with government uh, and a lot uh, on issues around development. Having a grounding in humanitarian principles uh, came up as being something that was really important, particularly for those networks that found themselves working in conflict situations. So in, in Afghanistan, Akbar's work to promote an NGO code of conduct which uh, reinforced their members' commitment to humanitarian principles was seen as being really important to the sustainability of the network. Likewise, the Mindanao Emergency Response Network in the Philippines uh, really fell back on its appeals to humanitarian principles when it found itself caught up in the conflict there or the ongoing conflict there, uh, which uh, caught, caught many of its staff who were trying to work across uh, religious boundaries. So having that basis in principles, even as the system change, remains a really important, uh, important success factor. That's what I was going to say. Thank you so much, Kim, for, it's, uh, um, for, for doing such a good job in taking what is, a, I think you'll find, I, think, I, I hope you'll enjoy reading it as well, um, a really very, very complex and very thoughtful report with a lot of, lot of sort of interesting angles and things that kind of you know, spark questions for taking all of that and putting it into <laughs> in such concise form. Thank you very much, Kim.